So I made a New Year's resolution to do a video essay before the end of 2022, and I sifted through countless ideas. Do I do a story time animation thing? No, because I don't have a lot of funny stories that I could tell in an animated format. Do I do a franchise sort of thing where I watch everything of something everybody already knows about and make it 12 hours long? No, that's way too much for my first video. So I started to think about what to do. Trailers for the new Pixar film Lightyear reminded me of a show I watched a lot as a kid on Disney Channel. One that sparked my love for sci-fi and space shit at a very young age that everyone is sure to remember. I swear I thought this was from the same universe as that Crash Nebula backdoor pilot, and people always thought I was talking out of my ass when I'd mention a kid who's literally just a brain with glasses. But I always remember the show playing around the same time they would show reruns of Buzz Lightyear Star Command on Toon Disney, but everybody remembers Buzz. As far as Lloyd, I legit found two video essays when I looked it up. One by Jordan Fringe, and another by Janiac Jr. that I'll mention later, but both are linked in the description if you want to check them out. Lloyd in Space was brought to life by the same guys who made Recess, Joe and Solo Bear and Paul Germain. Hey look, there they are now. Well, Paul, that's all the garbage for today. Ooh-wee, Joe, that is one ginormous ball of trash. Yep, sure is gonna be a lot of work hauling it off to the dump. A lot of work. The show is about Lloyd Nebulon, who's a green-skinned alien from the Verde Green race. He lives in the Intrepidville Space Station with his sister, the only telepath on the station, and his mother, Commander Nora Lee Nebulon. Lloyd goes on miscellaneous adventures and escapades with his friends, including Eddie R. Horton, Kurt Bloberts, and Douglas McNoggin. Lloyd in Space broadcasted from February 3rd, 2001 to February 27th, 2004, and ran for 39 episodes. But there is a rumored 40th episode that has gone unaired and is considered lost media. It had reruns air on Toon Disney and was soon replaced by The Emperor's New Groove around 2006. The show also had this bonus minute web series that were flash animated and voiced by the cast and were posted on a now defunct website. The Swift files are also busted unfortunately, but if you do decide to watch the series in full, I recommend giving these a watch. All 16 are posted on YouTube if you look hard enough, and they are a fun addition to your watch through of the series. It's like a cool time capsule because I remember going on the internet as a kid and finding flash games and bonus content of my favorite shows just like this all the time. Lloyd in Space is a very different show from Recess, despite a lot of the same people working on it. The 13-year-old titular character isn't confined to his school. We get to see the entire world, or galaxy, through his point of view. But unfortunately, Lloyd in Space isn't as remembered as his predecessor. Lloyd in Space is your pretty standard Saturday morning cartoon fare. It pretty much stays in the box, and that's probably why it wasn't as remembered as other cartoons like Buzz Lightyear, Recess, and House of Mouse. But that doesn't mean it was a bad show at all. There was a reason it received higher ratings than expected during the One Saturday Morning Cartoon blog on ABC in early 2001. In fact, I had a pretty good time rewatching it 15 years after its reruns on Toon Disney. Wait, shit, did I read that right? 15 years? Ugh, ugh. That's fucking disgusting. Oh my god, I'm so old. Lloyd P. Nebulon is our everyman. His design is pretty alien with the green skin, antenna, and pointed ears, but he's still just human enough to feel relatable to the kids watching at home. His design always reminded me of the Weekenders a little bit, with his like really square head and the way that his face looks. I don't know, maybe it's just me. But uh, apparently to a lot of characters in the show, he's also not the best looking kid. How come you look like me, but you're big and ugly? Don't worry about that. Francine, can you do me a favor before we go? Sure, buddy. Can you make me good looking again? Oh, yeah. Oh, thanks, Francine. That's better. Hey, Lloyd, don't feel so bad. I know how you can find a really freaky animal without even going to the pet store. Really? How? Just look in the mirror. <laughs> Eddie Horton is Lloyd's best friend, but he's also a little bit of an instigator. He's that kid that'll nudge you and be like, wouldn't it be funny if we, I don't know, fucked around this wormhole, fall in, find out it leads to the inside of this dumpster, and then we pretend we're in danger so people send us free shit? Yeah, something like that. Well, boys, you caused the mess with your shenanigans, so you clean it up. That seems fair to me. Any questions?
Do you have to be a warm person to work at Wormhole National Park? No. Has anyone ever tried to use you as bait? No. Do you consider it an insult when people mistake you for a slug? <sighs> Kurt Blobberts is the group's fat, dumb, sometimes funny guy. He's voiced by the same guy who does the voice of Patrick on SpongeBob SquarePants. In Kurt's first few appearances, he wasn't as explicitly stupid, but later on it seemed like the voice actor said, Hey Bill, you know that starfish fella you play on that new show? Yeah, just do that and it'll be perfect. They're basically the same character at the end of the day. I was hoping to try and finish this really hard book. The Little Brown Puppy Droid. Yeah, yeah, three years running. Try to get the stickers on the right page this time. Douglas McNoggin is the smart guy of the group. He'll sometimes just be a plot device, or literally make one for an episode, but he's just adorable. That isn't until he takes off his fucking glasses, alright? Those are just his fucking eyes. God, I yelped when he and his family took them off the first time. Francine Nebulon is Lloyd's bratty little sister. She's a telepath and loves screwing with her brother a lot, especially in earlier episodes of the series. It felt like she was literally out to get him and it honestly made me unable to stand her as a character. But as the show continued, Francine focused episodes showed that even though she's only four years old, she could be more mature than her older brother. She definitely grew on me throughout the series. Oh, hey, hey little kids, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Scaring people like that isn't funny at all. Oh, it's funny, but it isn't very nice, is it? No, it's not, Francine, and I'm sorry. I know. I heard you say so 50 years from now. Now let's go do some more trick-or-treating. Unless you want me to tell everyone what a bunch of crybabies you were. Commander Nora Lee Nebulon is a great mom character, though. Both strict, but very loving and supportive of her two kids. Episodes focus on adult characters only happen once in a while, but season 2's Nora's Big Date, story by Joe himself and Eric Garcia, was one of my favorite episodes. In this episode, Nora is running the station smooth as butter on her girl boss shit, going as far as fixing the recent power outage. Communications reached out to a mechanic, Herb Starfield, who's voiced by John DiMaggio, who came moments after Nora's repair, and she's smitten when she sees him. Herb and Nora decide they should go on a date, but Lloyd already dismisses him, recalling bad dates his mother already went through in the past. Well, because it never works out. Like, I remember this one guy, Ennui from Upsilon 8. <laughs> and so, I run figures from this guy's premium through my actuary tables, and he says to me, You call that an accidental disintegration benefit? I've got five trillion hatchlings to provide for! <laughs> I'm telling you, it's a crazy business. Turns out, after their first date, she had a great time. Lloyd starts snooping around, though, and spying on his mother's new boyfriend, finding out that Herb wears a mask, revealing a hideous monster. After crying wolf throughout the entire station, everyone gathers around to see Lloyd literally deface Herb. Nora steps in and tells everyone she already knew about Herb's mask situation since the first date, and that never mattered in the first place. She loved him for who he was on the inside, and understood that Lloyd, who was basically the man of the house, was jealous and confused about these big feelings, and possibly even bigger changes with Herb around. Nora has a sit down with Lloyd and they come to an agreement to talk out any issues that they may have instead of bottling it up and for Lloyd to remember that Nora, even though she is his mother, is also still just a person and she has needs just as much as Lloyd does. I love this episode in particular because I also went through these same angry feelings too when my own single parent got closer to somebody new. These are huge feelings and ideas that a 13 year old might not be able to grasp and can lead to poorly thought out decisions. But talking out those emotions helps everyone. Lloyd's mom is more than just his mother, or the strict and respected commander of Intrepidville, but she's also a woman who has needs that are too big for Lloyd and his sister to fill. Sometimes, Nora needs somebody grown up to talk to. At the end of the episode, Herb offers to take everyone out to dinner, and Lloyd takes the opportunity to tell him how he's feeling, and that he's sorry for embarrassing him in front of the entire station. And then, we never see Herb again. It's a shame that Nora doesn't get too much to do throughout the series after this, aside from being a mom and a commander who plays cleanup duty in some episodes, but she's not the only adult who gets the spotlight. Another personal favorite of mine is Season 3 Stinkorama, written by Joe Molinari. It's career day at Lloyd's school, and he and his friends must find a mentor to work with for the day. He and Eddie are just too cool for the lame jobs available to choose from, so they're assigned to Mr. Stinko the Garbage Man, who's made an appearance in every episode since he's in the intro. The boys are disgruntled at first, but soon start having fun working with Mr. Stinko and respect his job and what he does for the station more than they realized. 
They have to save the station from a meteor of garbage about to hit in Trepidville, caused by the self-inserts of Paul and Joe in the series. Eddie and Lloyd realize and appreciate Mr. Stinko and consider him one of the intergalactic space heroes they wanted to be when they grew up. We can stay with Lloyd and just do teenage shenanigans for an entire series, but it's really nice to see more of his world with episodes like Stinkorama. Not every character needs a backstory like Boomer, the assistant mechanic in the docking bay. He's a funny and chill guy, but the secret royalty plot isn't really my thing. But something grounded, like just hanging out with the garbage man, is really sweet. A lot of us, especially kids, don't consider where our trash goes in humanizing, in quotations because we're talking about aliens here, the people who do that job in a cartoon can affect how a kid can see them in real life, and maybe they'll show that appreciation too. Another job that kids might not appreciate as much as they should is a teacher, and Lena Space touches on that profession too, in season 4's At Home with the Bolts, written by Amy DeBartolomus and David Warwick. I honestly can't believe it took this long for me to talk about one of my favorite characters in the show, Mrs. Bolt, wonderfully voice acted by Tress McNeil. That smokes a pack a day sort of voice just adds to her character so much. I love it. In the real world, it would be upsetting to see a teacher be so crabby and sarcastic with her students, but man, putting that in a robot makes her so funny. Throughout the series, she dishes out witty one-liners in the classroom, especially with Nebulon. Our special jury award goes to Lloyd Nebulon. Congratulations, Nebulon. You actually managed to accomplish something. And at home with the Bolts, Mrs. Bolt invites her students to come to her place for a party, but no one shows up except for Lloyd. Mr. Bolt is such a sweet guy. It was his idea to host the party in the first place to make his robot wife happy. But then she realizes that no one else is going to show up. Lloyd goes through her movie collection just before and learns that she was a state-of-the-art teaching robot at one time, spiffy and brand new. Mrs. Bolt felt like she lost her purpose in the teaching world and it isn't helping to inspire future generations of students after newer models were released over the past century and a half. She decides to retire from teaching, which means that she literally shuts herself down. When Lloyd shows the clip to the rest of her class, they show up to her party and tell her that she indirectly inspired her students over the past year. Hey, Mrs. Bolt! I just want to say thank you for all those times you gave me detention for not doing my homework. Thanks to detention, I learned how to doodle like a pro. That boy has talent. And when you forced me to be lab partners with Goo Boy Blobberts, I learned how to totally avoid him at all costs. Really totally useful, Mrs. B. I don't know what they're talking about, but I learned... Uh... I learned about the Strathnor galaxy, the inner workings of a spleen, and the fascinating world of phytoplankton. I've never lectured on any of that. Uh, no, but your lecture on the history of the spoon drove me to read the entire encyclopedia in class. Yes, Mrs. Bolt, it's been a year of profound impact on each and every one of us. Now, obviously, these wouldn't be the ideal examples of a teacher's job well done, but it's still a great episode that gives a little more context to Lloyd and the audience as to why Mrs. Bolt is the way that she is. It's not an excuse to be so crass with her students, but it made me love this character even more because she's a machine, but she still has emotions. Speaking of students, Season 3's Neither Boy Nor Girl, written by Eric Garcia and Richard Whitley, is another great episode from the series and features one of the first non-binary characters I saw as a kid. We meet Zoit, an alien whose species doesn't choose their gender until their 13th birthday. The boys and girls in Lloyd's class try to figure out whether or not Zoid is a boy or girl based on their music taste, what kind of notebook they had. Even though the boys all have their own girly notebook covers if you look close enough. And even try to scope out which bathroom they'll use after glugging down a giant slushie. The boys and girls spend the weekend exposing Zoid to their respective gender's experiences so they can decide what gender they'd like to be at the end of the weekend. When it's revealed that both sides are pressuring Zoid to choose over a bet they made, they're rightfully upset and decide to keep their decision a secret. But, but why not? Because it's none of your business. So we'll never find out if you're a boy or a girl? Oh, you'll find out someday when I get a crush on one of you. See ya! So I guess you could be non-binary before you could be gay back in 2002, back when this episode was released. This episode aged pretty okay compared to other LGBT representation at the time. Zoit wasn't really played for laughs, more so we laugh at the boys and girls for not being able to wrap their heads around the idea of not being either gender. At least I did. I think Zoit not telling anyone the gender they chose is also a nice touch because honestly, 
did it really matter in the first place? It's a little sad that Zoid doesn't make an appearance again in the series, but for what it's worth, it was a nice time getting to know this cool kid in the one episode we had to spend with him. Geniac Jr. made a great video on this specific episode a while back, and I have it linked in the description in case you're interested in hearing more about this episode. Check it out if you have a chance. The last episode I want to talk about is also from Season 4, The Big Feud, written by Eric Garcia. The class is given a project by Vice Principal Feely, voiced by Richard Kine, to showcase their planet's respective cultures. Eddie focuses on Earth, Lloyd does his project on the Verdigrian people, Douglas must talk about the Cerebellians, and Kurt presents his project on the Blobulans. Eddie and Lloyd learn a lot about their ancient cultures from their families, but Douglas and Kurt's parents don't really want to talk about their histories. The two boys, instead, go to the library and decide to find out for themselves. They learn that the Blobulons and the Cerebellians both have their own rich cultures, but they feuded with each other over a moon that their two planets shared. Douglas and Kurt tell their parents about what they learned, and suddenly, their parents' prejudice start to come through and imprint on the boys, especially Douglas. Kurt, you failed to deploy the phalanx as I ordered, effectively nullifying our foolproof maneuver. Oh, I'm sorry, Douglas. The cherries look so yummy, I just had to have them. Had to have them? But their point value was infinitesimal. Infinitable? Oh, yes. Never mind. It's a matter of strategy and whatnot. It's really not fair of me to expect one of you people to understand. I beg your pardon? The former best friends begin to hate each other, and then their families follow suit, leading to, well, a big feud. People from both of their planets begin to fight at the culture fair, and Lloyd and Eddie try to stop it on their own, but it makes things worse. I don't know if it was Lloyd saying both sides were being dumb, or whatever the fuck Eddie got on. Son, please take them damn feathers out of your head. The two groups chase Lloyd and Eddie, and the boys fall into a gravity core. Douglas and Kurt put aside their differences to help their best friends. Their parents, however, are still arguing when the boys are saved by Nora, and Douglas and Kurt tell them off for being so close-minded and being prejudiced against each other. Thank you, Kurt. Mother, father, there will be no more arguing with the Blobberts. At least not in front of me. You're setting a terrible example. But, 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 son! Apparently, some traditions are best not passed down. If you have a problem with Blobulons, kindly keep it just that. Your problem. <laughs> Do they have problems? Please don't say that, Dad. You might hurt my friend Douglas's feelings. But Racism is always a heavy topic. But having these funny looking characters go through those feelings was a great way to handle it. Prejudice is not something that someone is born with, but something someone is taught. I'm glad this sort of episode was reserved for the last season of the show, since it gave viewers time to know that Kurt and Douglas are the best of buds, and wouldn't have a reason to hate each other based on where they came from and what their ancestors did. It's awesome that the younger generation showed maturity to know that this sort of hatred isn't okay, and it was great to see Douglas and Kurt mend the relationship by the end of the half hour. Lloyd in Space is a good show. I can understand why it wasn't as memorable as the other shows that aired during both its original run and its time being broadcasted as reruns. It was a pretty formulaic show, and only goes outside of the teen fights day-to-day -day boredom in space every so often. Like Jordan Fringe said at the end of their video, this show should be put on Disney+. Plus. Let newer generations watch a show that's pretty timeless and is just a fun and heartwarming time, even when messages can be a little on the nose. It was a lot of fun going down this nostalgia train with a show I literally hadn't watched in over a decade and a half, and it felt like a perfect place to start with my first of hopefully many video essays to come. So hey party people, it's that time of year for my favorite holiday and it starts with this! Also, um, before you go, I had no idea where to put this, but if I had a nickel for every time they made a reference to Gettysburg and Lloyd in space, I'd have two nickels, which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it happened twice, right? In season 3's That's Debatable, they passed by an alien parody of the Lincoln Memorial, and he gave a parody version of the Gettysburg Address, which was a speech given at the dedication of the Gettysburg National Cemetery during the Civil War after the Union defeated the Confederacy. In season 4, Lloyd goes back in time all the way to Gettysburg and is somehow on the fucking confederate side? Man. And that's a wrap. Thank you very much for watching my first video essay. This is a lot of fun to do and even if this doesn't like do well, I'll still try to make these as I can. 
if you enjoyed it, please do me a favor and like, comment, subscribe, ring the bell, follow all my shit, drink some water. Um, the Geniac Jr. and Jordan Fringe videos are in the description below. And I also made a Patreon. Don't know what kind of content to put there yet, but consider it like a tip jar for now. Uh, feel free to support it if you'd like me to continue making stuff like this. And $5 patrons will have their name in the credits of the next video, which I already have a good idea for what I want to do next. Um, anyways, have a good day. Deuces.